It's ridiculous. It has to stop. That is how Assistant District Attorney Christopher Conroy began his description in court today of Donald Trump's violations of the gag order against him before Judge Juan Mershon continued the jury selection process, which ended the day with the full jury of 12 seated and one of the six alternate jurors chosen. The judge plans to seat five more alternate jurors, possibly tomorrow, and be ready to hear opening statements from both sides in the case beginning Monday. When the, when the 12th juror was seated today, the judge said, we have our jury. The day started with a new presentation by Assistant District Attorney Christopher Conroy about Donald Trump's newest violations of the gag order against him. And as predicted on this program last night, Donald Trump's attack on the jury that we reported here last night was presented to the judge beginning with these words. This is the most disturbing post. District Attorney Conroy reminded the judge of, quote, of the specific direction and order that your honor gave the defendant on Tuesday in court related to an outburst he had when the juror was at the rail. That District Attorney Conroy reported to the judge that last evening, quote, the defendant posted on his Truth Social account the following. They are catching undercover liberal activists trying to, lying to the judge in order to get on the Trump jury. Donald Trump's lawyer insisted that that was not a violation of the gag order. In fact, he said, it brings to light some of the ambiguities in the order. The Trump lawyers insisted that the gag order did not prevent, quote, reposting statements that are already in public by others. That is, of course, another lie told by a Trump lawyer in court directly to a judge. The gag order prevents Donald Trump from, quote, making <clears throat> or directing others to make public statements about any prospective juror or any juror in this criminal proceeding. Here is the lie that Jesse Waters told on Fox yesterday at 5.28 p.m. when Donald Trump was watching. They are trying to rig this jury. They are catching undercover liberal activists lying to the judge. Jesse Waters is the newest liar to occupy the 8 p.m. slot on Fox, the lying channel, a network that has been adjudicated to have told $785.5 million worth of lies in a defamation case. The previous occupant of the 8 p.m. slot had told so many of those lies that even Fox decided they had to let him go. And the occupant, be occupant before that one of the 8 p.m. slot lost his job only after being exposed as a grievous serial sexual harasser at Fox, who in just one case paid $32 million to one woman, Bill O'Reilly, sexually harassed. Jesse Waters got his start at Fox as Bill O'Reilly's errand boy, running around with a microphone on the sidewalk, following people down the street, trying to get them to talk to him, whatever O'Reilly wanted him to do. Jesse Waters is the same person who last week said publicly that he believed that the minimum wage produces an income of $100,000 a year in America. That's how stupid you can be on Fox at 8 p.m., or in the case of Jesse Waters, also at 5 p.m. Jesse Waters was taught how to lie on TV by his mentor, the now banished Bill O'Reilly, and he is paid for it by Rupert Murdoch. Jesse Waters said they are trying to rig the jury. That is a lie. Jesse Waters said... They are catching undercover liberal activists. That is a lie. There has not been a single liberal activist or conservative activist revealed in the jury selection process. Not one. And Jesse Waters said that they are lying to the judge. And that is a lie. 
That is a pure Bill O'Reilly, Jesse Waters style lie invented from absolutely nothing. And 18 minutes after Jesse Waters extemporaneously delivered that lie on the Fox Lying Channel, Donald Trump wrote this lie. They are catching undercover liberal activists lying to the judge in order to get on the Trump jury, and Donald Trump assigned that lie, in quotation marks, to Jesse Waters. The problem on that now for Donald Trump is twofold. One, Donald Trump rewrote Jesse Waters' lie, so he cannot put it in quotation marks the way he did and ascribe it to Jesse Waters. Jesse Waters never said the phrase, in order to get on the Trump jury. That's Donald Trump's original composition. That's his writing. So that is going to become a challenge for Donald Trump's lawyers when this issue is the subject of a hearing on Tuesday. Because today, Donald Trump's lawyer claimed that Donald Trump was just reposting statements that are already in public by others. That's not what Donald Trump did. He rewrote that statement. And here's the second part of Donald Trump's problem. It doesn't matter whether he quoted Jesse Waters accurately or not because the gag order against Donald Trump prevents Donald Trump from making statements about any prospective juror or any actual juror in this criminal proceeding. Donald Trump made a statement about the jurors in this case at 5.46 p.m. last night. And that's what made the district attorney throw up his hands this morning and say, it's ridiculous, it has to stop. To which Judge Juan Mershon said, nothing other than, quote, after the hearing, I will rule. Judge Mershon did not warn Donald Trump today to make no more statements about the jury. None of the six other violations of the gag order that the district attorney brought to the judge's attention this morning prompted the judge to issue an immediate verbal warning to Donald Trump sitting right in front of him and his lawyers about Donald Trump's violations of the gag order. The judge did not warn Donald Trump that this kind of thing, that could, this is the kind of thing that could actually get him thrown in jail. Nothing like that was said. The judge's plan, if he has one, appears to be, let me get my jury seated and all of the alternate jurors seated, and then on Tuesday, we'll try to deal with this. When Donald Trump left the courtroom today, he did not talk about the jurors. He did not talk about witnesses. He did not violate the gag order in any way. He did, however, tell this lie. I'm supposed to be in New Hampshire. I'm supposed to be in Georgia. I'm supposed to be in North Carolina, South Carolina. I'm supposed to be in a lot of different places campaigning. But I've been here all day uh, on a trial that really is a very unfair trial. New Hampshire is half an hour away in Donald Trump's private plane. The most distant of those states, Georgia, is two hours away in Donald Trump's private plane. South Carolina, North Carolina, all easy to get to yesterday when there was no court session and Donald Trump stayed home and did absolutely nothing. In fact, most presidential campaigns easily cover four states in one day, especially when three of them are contiguous. Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, that's an easy sweep in one day. Donald Trump could have gone to every one of those states yesterday in his private plane, but he didn't. And he's lying about the trial, costing him one minute of campaign time. It hasn't done that. He remains the laziest presidential campaigner in history. That same person who has been falling asleep in the courtroom, just doesn't seem to have the energy for the campaign trail. Certainly not the way Joe Biden does, who was once again in Pennsylvania today. Donald Trump's lie about not being able to campaign was not his only complaint today. His other complaint was, I suppose, more understandable, coming from a 77-year-old man from Florida. And I'm sitting here for days now, from morning till night, in that freezing room, freezing.
We are monitoring breaking news in Iran. For more, we're going to be joined now by NBC News, Pentagon and national security correspondent Courtney Cuby. Courtney, what do we have? So, Lawrence, there has been some breaking news all this evening that we've been trying to get more detail on. Here's what we know so far. According to Iran's semi-official state media, that's FARS, they are saying that there have been a series of explosions in Iran, in a city called Isfahan. Now, why a lot of our viewers may have heard of that city is because it's where some of Iran's critical nuclear infrastructure exists. But so far, it seems that these explosions are not specifically in Isfahan, where the nuclear facility is, but are nearby. Now, the U.S. US officials are not saying anything about this. Neither are Israeli officials. But, of course, this all comes when there has been this back and forth between Iran and Israel and threats for both, from both sides. Now, of course, on April 1st, the Israeli military struck a site in Damascus, which was later determined to be some sort of a consular site killing a number of senior Iranian officials, including a general, a senior general in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. We all, of course, we know, Lawrence, that last weekend, Iran retaliated with pretty great force, about 300 projectiles, missiles and drones, most of which were shot down. But Israel again vowed to respond. Now, among the possible response options that we have been hearing about this week that Israel briefed the U.S. on ahead of the strikes last weekend was the possibility of some sort of a response inside Iran, but also the possibility of strikes against proxy forces and, and against Iranian uh, facilities outside of Iran. There are also some reports tonight of explosions in Syria and in Iraq. But I really have to stress at this point, we do not have any confirmation who was behind any of these explosions, these possible strikes, other than to say everyone has really been waiting on edge to see if Israel would respond to this massive volley of strikes that they took against Israel, that Iran took against Israel on Saturday, Lawrence. And Courtney, uh, this is ahead of where our information is now, but a few days from now or whatever amount of time it takes, when would we have or could we have an accurate assessment, damage assessment of what might have actually occurred tonight? So we're already seeing, frankly, some social media video of explosions over the skies in Isfahan. There's some things that are starting to come out from both Iraq and Syria. So we may get a better sense of that in the next day or so. It's, it's about daylight in, in, in all three locations right now, uh, Friday morning. So we may get a sense of that. The real question, though, is will we get any attribution to this? Now, keep in mind, there are there's a widespread knowledge that Israel ta has taken a number of strikes inside Syria in recent years, specifically going usually going after Lebanese Hezbollah, going after shipments of component parts, advanced missile parts uh, that, that Iran ships to Hezbollah in Syria. And they very rarely, if ever, acknowledge any of those strikes. It would not be it, it, it would not surprise me if we don't have any statement of attribution for who is behind these, except for the fact that Israel has been vowing to respond here. So, again, I have to say we still don't know what who or what caused these explosions in these three locations. We've been working on this feverishly for a matter of hours now, Lawrence, and we'll continue. But at this point, again, the U.S. and the Israelis are not saying anything. And, and even Iran, while acknowledging there have been explosions, is not saying who or what was behind them. Courtney Huby, Pentagon correspondent, thank you very much for that. Really appreciate it. We're going to come back to you as, you as this story develops. And joining us now is Ben Rhodes, who served as Deputy National Security Advisor to President Obama. He's an MSNBC political analyst. Ben, uh, will on the issue of attribution, uh, will the United States issue a statement of uh, having nothing to do with it, possibly? Yeah, that's quite possible. Uh, in, in fact, Lawrence, in the past, even when Israel has taken strikes against Iranian targets in third countries, in places like Lebanon and Syria, um, sometimes the United States does put out a statement to clarify that it itself was not involved. Um, that said, I mean, it's not a mystery, you know, um, if you have this kind of 
uh, attack, particularly if it's in Isfahan uh, and if it's against Iranian proxies in places like Iraq and Syria, um, I, I don't think there's going to be a ton of mystery around it. Uh, I think what we can say with assurance is that the United States itself did not participate in, in that kind of military activity. What do you expect uh, in, in terms of the unfolding of this information at this hour? When might we hear something from uh, more, more clear uh, for, or something official from the Pentagon? Well, I think that, you know, it's likely that assuming Israel carried out these strikes, um, they would notify the United States probably shortly beforehand. Uh, if they did carry out strikes inside of Iran at a place like Isfahan, um, that obviously would go against what Joe Biden had counseled them, which is to not uh, directly retaliate against Iranian territory. Um, I think the U.S. has a greater degree of tolerance and understanding of uh, Israeli strikes against Iranian proxies across the region. But even in the event in which the Israeli government knows that the Biden administration might not support their action, they would still notify the United States. I think that it's necessary, though, to wait and see whether this is the conclusion of uh, a military action. Is this a series of kind of one-off strikes in Iraq and Syria and Iran, uh, or is it the beginning of several strikes that could take place in different places? Um, I, I think the U.S., before it comments in any formal way, would obviously want to know and be certain um, that this latest round of escalation has concluded. Um, so, you know, I'd expect that uh, to happen kind of over our night. Um, but again, I think the U.S. will also take some lead from whether or not Israel is publicly commenting, publicly uh, taking responsibility uh, for these strikes. I, I, you know, given how much Israel said that it was going to respond, um, even though they've it's sometimes been reluctant to claim responsibility for certain military actions, given how far they've been out there saying they're going to respond, you know, I, I have to assume we get some confirmation from the Israeli side, too, um, in the coming hours. Uh Take us inside the White House on a night like this. Uh, they've had this information, uh, Courtney indicates, for a number of hours now. Uh, you've been there. You've been in the White House where this kind of information comes across at, say, uh, 8 p.m., and you end up spending the rest of the night there. Uh, what's happening uh, in the offices that you used to be in at this hour in this situation? Well, I mean, I think what you'd be doing is if you find out that something like this is happening that's a significant potential escalation in the Middle East, you're bringing everybody together uh, in the White House Situation Room uh, and by secure video conference to the Pentagon and the State Department and the intelligence community. Number one, you're trying to ascertain what happened. Uh, mm -hmm. If Israel did take military action, what were their targets? What was their success in hitting those targets? Number two, you're taking extra precautions to secure U.S. personnel and military facilities across the region and diplomatic facilities. By the way, Lawrence, you know, we have vulnerable facilities to potential Iranian reprisal in places like Iraq. And so part of, you know, job one uh, of any administration is to make sure that we're uh, ramping up the defenses of our personnel if we see escalation in the region. Then I think you're undertaking a diplomatic strategy, reaching out to Israel to get an understanding, OK, if you did do this, is this it, uh, or is this the beginning of further escalation? Reaching out to other countries in the region, the Arab states, what are they hearing? Uh, trying to send messages uh, to the Iranians. Don't respond. We're trying to de-escalate. We're trying to avoid uh, this becoming a regional war. And so those are your main priorities, understanding what's happening, protecting U.S. personnel and facilities in the region, and trying to avert an escalation that clearly the Biden administration doesn't want. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.